Hello everybody, my name is Chris Brady, author of the Boeing 737 Tech Guide and the Boeing 737 Tech Site. And this uh, video presentation is about the P-8A Poseidon. So including this today, we'll look at the history and development of the P-8. Uh, then a look around the external features, coming inside onto the flight deck for differences from a regular NG, looking at the, uh, the instrument panels, electronic panel and overhead panels. Look at then at some of the vulnerability reduction features uh, uniquely fitted to this aircraft and then finally a, uh, a look around the, the cabin. As always, please treat your company training uh, manuals as the authoritative source of information. One extra note to mention with this uh, this video, given its content, um, I should say that this presentation uses a combination of unclassified material found on various open internet sources, press articles, um, actually some uh, government uh, press re releases as well, uh, and photographs from my own library taken at public events. Nothing is reproduced here that isn't already in the public domain. Okay, let's start with the, uh, with the history and development of the aircraft. So where did it all begin? Um, it began here with the, uh, the venerable P-3 Orion, which was uh, based on the Lockheed Electra airframe. Um, this first flew in 1958 and has been an extensive military service ever since. Uh, production uh, only actually ceased in 1991, which I was uh, surprised to learn uh, that it was as late as that, um, with a massive 650 of these having been built. Uh, the one in the photo is actually an EP3 Ares, um, very similar, but it basically it's, it's the uh, electronic wolf or the AWACS version of the, um, of the Orion. Um, and the one in the photo is, is, is what the, the, the E7 Wedgetail is, it will be uh, replacing. So, um, yeah, it's, uh, the, the, there's, there's quite a gap to fill there with, with, with 650 of those to be replaced. So, um, this is the P-8. Uh, it's a military derivative of the 737-800 IGW, the increased gross weight version. And that basically is an 800 with 900 wings and 900 weight lifting capability. The idea was conceived back in 2000 when it was uh, initially known as the Multi-Mission Maritime Aircraft, the MMA, and it eventually made its first flight in April 2009 and entered service uh, about four years later in November 2013. The P-8 program manager at the time uh, described the aircraft as a bit of, of J-STARS, a little bit of AWACS, and a bit of MC2A thrown in as well with the added ability to go kill a submarine. And really, I think that um, that still describes it to, to, to this day. It kind of does everything, um, which, is, which is quite impressive, quite impressive. Weight to the aircraft, as I've already said, it's um, it's an 800 on a on on 900 wings, so the 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 maximum weights are, are increased significantly. Uh, a natural fact, the PA is the heaviest version of the, of the NG ever to fly. Uh, list of weights there, but I guess the the, the headline one is the uh, the max takeoff weight of 189,200 pounds, or um, just shy of 86 tons. There've been um, 176 orders for the for the P-8 so far. The U.S. Navy uh, getting the lion's share at 125. India uh, 18, Australia 14, the U.K. 9, five to Norway, six to Korea, four to New Zealand, five to Germany, and the Canadians have just come in with a, a letter of request for 16. So far, the global fleet of P-8s have amassed over half a million flight hours, so it's, a, it's, it's now quite a well-proven airframe. 
just a word on that Canadian um, letter of request. Uh, Canada actually needs to replace its CP140 Aurora fleet. Now they are basically very, very similar to the Orion. It's it, it, it's based on the same airframe, but you know Canada did a lot of uh, changes and development to it. Um, they need a new uh, multi-mission aircraft and in March this year Canada submitted a letter of request through the, the US government's foreign military sales program outlining its requirements and requesting an offer. Those requirements include um, up to 16 P8s uh, and associated equipment and initial servicing as well as access to intellectual property and technical data as you would imagine to, uh, to run a fleet. Um, I guess a, a word of caution, it should be noted that the issuance of an LOR doesn't actually commit Canada to purchasing it. Um, the final decision, they say, will be based on the capability offered, availability, pricing and benefits to Canadian industry. And of course, what other aircraft, you know, m might be out there offering, offering you know, th this kind of capability. Personally, I would be surprised if, if Canada didn't go for the, um, for the P-8. Um, I guess it's it's really coming down to haggling on 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 price like like most things. Okay, um, increments. <laughs> These are basically what what we would probably know as marks or you, you know the, the development of the of the P eight. Um, whilst it's quite a uh, you know still quite a young aircraft, there have been um, a lot of developments already. Uh, you know, such as the the pace of change of uh, of of you know cutting edge technology. Uh, the original P8s uh, from 2013 onwards, these were known as Increment One. Uh, they've got the basic tactical system. Uh, from 2000, sorry, 2016. My apologies. 2016 Increment Two uh, became operational. This added um, broad area multi-static acoustic uh, anti-sub -war warfare capability, um, referred to as multi-static active coherence or MAC, um, and that significantly increases the the P8's anti-sub warfare search rate in literal env environments and literal obscure where it basically means close to the shore um it adds an automated identification system and high altitude anti-sub weapons high altitude being key because the um because obviously the p8 you know like all let, let's call it a jet airline you know what where, where it came from they operate best and, and and can can stay longer on task at high altitude so that's quite a a useful development Increment three, uh, this focuses on network ready open systems, uh, electronics architecture and network enabled weapons. So it's it's much more sort of behind the scenes, you know, get communications type um, uh, improvement. Uh, still, you know, very significant, um, but but nothing you can obviously see, certainly from the outside. The um, Increment 3 Block 1, i.e. the first batch of retrofit kits, they will enable the aircraft to carry uh, Harpoon Block 2, um, anti-ship missile and Link 16 data link as well as comms upgrades. That should be fully operational by the end of this year, 2023. The Increment 3 Block 2 capabilities, um, the, the, i.e. the second phase of Increment 3, uh, three this includes wideband satellite comms, new computing, security architecture, uh, anti-surface warfare, signal intelligence, um, combat system architecture improvements, and communication capability upgrades. This is going to take a few years yet, and uh, the target year for, for operation is 2026. So, um, there's the development so far, but what of the aircraft's future? And for, for such a young aircraft, I say it only became operational in 2013, so here we are just 10 years later talking about the aircraft's future. Um, but it is an issue, um, because as we know, the, the, the PA, it's based on the, the 737 NG, and that's been out of production since late 2019, following the uh, the introduction of the MAX. The PA, 
fortunately was always built on its own dedicated production line because of the you know the the, the vast number of, of changes and differences to a regular 7378 uh, ng so it was always on its own production line and that is what's kept the thing open so far um, now Boeing has enable that line to stay open for what's it been four years ago since the the, the last ng was produced um, by reducing the pa production rate to the minimum sustainable rate of one aircraft per month uh, to extend the line viability but the thing is with most of the p8s now delivered the future of that line is now in in real jeopardy existing outstanding orders should delay a shutdown decision only until the end of this year that's pending additional orders uh, such as the the, the Canadian order um, or the Canadian LOR but once closed the ability to reopen that production line is highly unlikely I mean realistically it won't happen and no more will be built unless the decision is made to move to the max airframe that will add a significant delay and cost to the program. The development times for for having a P8 based on on the Max airframe will be years, um, and and the price will increase, you know, hugely over a, an NG based P8. So really, uh, it's kind of the last chance saloon for any uh, nations who are thinking of ordering the. the the, the P8 or, or, or getting top up orders to the P8s to, to do it and, and to do it now which I'm sure is a message that um, the, the Boeing are taking to those those prospective countries so um, on to the external features uh, this uh, graphic I, I, I drew several years ago uh, gives an overview of um, and really you know without me talking you through every single one of these on, on this graphic it just gives you an idea of, of how many external differences there are and they're not all listed on on, on this graphic um, but it, you know it's from a distance it may look like a 737 but up close uh, it is quite quite different Dimensions, uh, as I've already said, it's it's a 737-800, so it's got the same dimensions as an 800, with the uh, the exception of the wingspan. Um, it has raked wing tips instead of blended uh, winglets. They add 1.85 meters. That's six foot one in old money over a blended winglet, um, giving a total span of 123 foot six inches. So it is. It is wider than a um, than a than a regular 737 or uh, broader wingspan. The nose cone. Uh, so again, starting from the front, just just working our way, um, you know, anti-clockwise around around the aircraft. Uh, nose cones had some changes on increment one P8. Uh, it was actually extended by four inches to accommodate the uh, the radar. With increment 2, the radar was changed the smaller ANAPY-10, which I'll come on to talk about in a moment, and the nose cone went back to normal. Um, the P8s have always had black nose cones, uh, except the one in this photo. This was a 2021 model uh, delivered to the RAF. Um, and the one of the, the things which jumped out to me was it had a grey nose cone. Um, that my theory is it, it's it's due to a change in in radome de-icing. Um, I don't know. I haven't had it confirmed, but I will come on to discuss uh, all the new de-icing uh, capabilities of the P8 in uh, in later slides, and you'll see why I think it's that. The probes are unchanged from the MG, um, as you can see there, but alternate static ports have been relocated, and I'll point those out in a couple of slides. So this uh, th this new radar under the nose, um, the original radar, and I'm I'm not actually sure which photo this is. I think this is the original radar, um, but I but I could be wrong. Um, it was the APS 137D V5 synthetic aperture radar for both coastal and overland surveillance. I believe this was only fitted to um, to to the US P8. Uh, I'm not quite sure which radar other nationalities got. 
Um, with increment 2, the, uh, the APS-137D uh, was replaced by the Raytheon ANAPY-10 maritime littoral, which was the big improvement, and overland surveillance radar. Um, it's got reduced size, weight and power consumption, which are all good things. It's got additional target track capability, a new colour weather radar avoidance mode, and room for technology growth. Uh, the radar apparently also provides ultra HD imaging modes for maritime and overland operations. So uh, so a big improvement from, from increment 2 onwards. The, uh, the APY-10 can be used for standard synthetic aperture radar, uh, synthetic aperture radar mode, or inverse synthetic aperture radar, um, weather radar, and periscope detection modes. Um, synthetic aperture radar is used to provide long distance imagery of ports, cities, runways, and things. Um, and the imagery can help identify targets at distance far outside um, your, your sort of standoff range. ISAR, which is the inverse SAR, that will give a two dimensional image of ships that can be used to help identify the vessels at long distance and used for target classification. ISO can also be used to determine ship length and overall mass structure. So again, it's all about like, being able to identify vessels at you know a, a longer and longer distance away uh, to keep the pH safe and to be able to you know sort of fire and forget from from range if if, if necessary. Underneath the aircraft, you've got one of these, uh, an MX twenty HD. Uh, it's retractable. It's an uh, electro-optical infrared sensor turret. Um, two of the workstations in the in the cabin have got joystick hand controllers for the turret, or at least I think that's the config on the uh, on the the US ones. I'm not sure it's it's necessarily two on all the other nationalities that operate the aircraft. The video feed from that turret can be shown. Um, on the inboard or lower DUs for the uh, for the pilots, as well as of course on the on all the consoles in the back. Um, interesting, when that turret's extended, it interferes with the standby altimeter, um, and RVSM is not authorised with it extended. That's a little bizarre point. I'm not quite sure if that anomaly will ever be uh, cleared up, but I can't imagine that the um, that the P8 will ever particularly need to have all the SM capability with the turret extended so it's it, you know it's an oddity but it's not really uh, of of any you know major operational significance um, according to the manufacturer who are L3 Harris again this is just taken from from their website none of this is um, you know in, in any way classified uh, the Westcam MX 20 HD is ideal for high altitude, long range maritime patrol and persistent surveillance. It's got a gyro stabilized HD thermal, HD daylight, HD low light, and HD shortwave uh, infrared cameras. So there you go. So it's HD, I think, is the thing they're pushing there. All right, going back to the outside of the aircraft, let's see. Uh, Let's point out a few of the differences. Um, the blister on the front there, just sort of forward and below the uh, door one left, that's the ANL Q240 uh, ESM pod. Um, moving back, the next significant pod is the missile warning system. Uh, you've then got uh, a large observer's window actually on both sides of the aircraft, left and right in, the, in that position. They're much larger than regular passenger windows. Um, and they are heated uh, partially to ensure a clear view out of the the, the window, and partially just for uh, because of its size, just to give it some um, uh, some shatterproof protection. Uh, you know, heated window has got more strength than an unheated one, which is which is more brittle, as we know from flight deck window heating. Um, you can see uh, over on the right of picture there a large bulge on the cowling. Um, that's because inside there is, is a 180 kVA IDG, so it's you know twice the size of the um, of, of the civilian IDGs. Uh, and that's required to run the, the large amount of, of onboard electrical equipment. 
Uh, along the bottom there, the uh, well, the forward one of the two, the, the alternate static port, that's being moved forward away from the uh, the MWS fairing, and the same on the other side as well. If you look at the location of the alternate static port on your civilian NG, you will see uh, it kind of forms a nice sausage triangle. The, the 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 three points between that, the regular static port, and where the the civilian alternate static port is so it, it, in other words just below where the MWS pod is that's where it is on on our civilian 737s because of the 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 aerodynamic interference from that pod they move the alternate static port forward and the last thing there just sort of behind and below the MWS pod is uh, one of four um, uh, CMDS, in other words, you know, uh, sort of chaff and flare dispensers. Um, there's one on the other side, and there's a pair at the back as well, which I'll show you in a later slide. Um, while we're at the front of the aircraft, the, um, the the cute thing the P8's got is an air-to-air -air refueling receptacle uh, just after the flight deck. Um, the uh, the fuel system itself has got uh, up to seven auxiliary fuel tanks, three forward and four aft, uh, giving a total fuel capacity of 71,500 pounds or 32,500 uh, tonnes. Um, two of those forward auxiliary fuel tanks must be removed if you're operating with the AAS pod. That's just, you know, uh, weight and balance considerations giving the PA an endurance of around about 12 hours and that's without refueling uh, with air to air refueling I guess it's um, well pretty much indefinite um, d d depending on, on you know how long everybody inside can last and you know the various other systems um, but uh, but 12 hours without air to air refueling and I would say you know probably reasonably up to 24 hours um, operationally with air to air refueling is probably not out of the question under the wings, uh, again, things we don't see on our uh, civilian 737s are two underwing hard points on each wing, four in total for, uh, well, shown here, uh, AGM 84D um, Block 1C harpoons or Mark 62 mines. The, um, the harpoon in this photo, because this was taken at uh, Farnborough Air Show, uh, this is the, the captive air training missile. Uh, the one used for, for classroom and air training exercises to train flight crews in tactical mission scenarios as well as train ground crews in handling, uh, loading and, and, and downloading or off the wing procedures. This is the real thing. Um, uh, this is on a P8 from uh, VP8, uh, head of a mission in the, in the, uh, the Fifth Fleet area, uh, which is out in the Persian Gulf Red Sea. Um, that photo was taken in Jan 2021 uh, by uh, by the US Navy. It was announced a couple of years ago that the RGL-84 Harpoon is going to be replaced by long-range anti-ship missile, the, the LRASM from Lockheed Martin, by 2024. I'm not quite sure how that timeline is still going, but... Um, let, let, let's assume that that's still realistic. The LRSM, it's a derivative of the AGM 158C, uses a multimodal sensor suite, weapons data link, and enhanced digital anti jam GPS. And that's it dropping from the uh, from, from a Rockwell B1. The, um, the Navy is also looking to equip the P 8 with uh, Joint Direct Attack Munitions, JDAMs, small diameter bombs, and miniature air launch decoy. So uh, there's a lot of things in store for the uh, for the P8 in in uh, coming years. Up there on the top of the fin, you got the Imarsat Sapcom. Um, you, you see this actually on some civilian 737s, particularly BBJs. Um, I'm not saying the the, the sat kit is the same inside. I I very much doubt it is. Um, but but certainly they they've they've borrowed the antenna from um, from the the civilian world. Um, th th these are a couple of 
new unknown vents. I'm I'm not sure what they are. My my guess is that they're air intakes uh, for cooling for some of the kit around the uh, the tail cone, but I don't know. And, and I, again, there's a lot of things I I don't know about the P8. Um, but I've I've just included these, you know, just to show you how uh, you know how different the aircraft is to uh, to, to the civilian version. This is the, the the kind of kit at the back that um, that I think those air scoops may cool. But as I say, it's it's just a guess on my part. Now this boom uh, above the APU adductor, it's <laughs> it's unknown. Um, but the lengthened boom has a ma magnetic anomaly detector, a, a, a MAD probe on on the Indian version, known as the um, as, as the, which is the P8I. Now. Surprise! While we're talking about Mads, because th th this is this is kind of quite significant. Surprisingly, for a sub hunter, which the P8 is, it doesn't have a, 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 a Mad, a, a magnetic anomaly detector. Its primary detection methods are acoustic, and this is because Mads work best at low altitude. And the P8 was designed to to operate at high altitude to to enable it to patrol you know large areas as fuel efficiently as possible uh, you know to, to enable it to stay on task for longer and, ha and have um, you know a, a greater range so really mad doesn't work when when, when you're up at high uh, high level um, my guess is and again it's only my guess I think that the aircraft was either designed or provisioned to have a mad boom there and again my guess is that at a late stage the the, the US Navy said actually no we don't want it it's not going to work for, for our you know anticipated type of operations um, keep it in cap it off and if we change our minds we can put one in or if, if we want to put something else in we can so my belief is that's empty um, and only the Indians use it on the P8I, but <laughs> I don't know. If anybody knows, you know, let me know. Uh, I'd be I'd be fascinated to hear. Um, so to compensate for the lack of a built-in mad, the the P8 has got a drone. Um, it's uh, it's it's a little 16 kilo kilogram unmanned drone, equipped with uh, high altitude anti sub uh, uh targeting air system. Uh, MAD sensor and algorithms. It's air deployable from anywhere between 500 to 25,000 feet. It's able to operate in salt spray, in rain and search an area as large as four square nautical miles an hour and provide constant target position with revisit rates of less than 10 seconds. So it is a very, very capable little drone and it neatly gets around the the, 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 the 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 whole issue of the P8 not having a mad boom and wanting to operate at high altitude for for range and endurance what it can do is it can just fire one of these things out from 25,000 feet this will descend down to you know near the the, the ocean surface surface um, looking for any uh, magnetic anomalies and communicating them back with the mothership so um, so there we go that's uh, that's what that does okay the p8i this is the the indian version of the of the p8 um and it's got an extended mad boom i i i it's got a mad boom in there um the the, the housing's been ex extended um it's supplied by cae it's an anasq 508a um it's also got aft facing telephonics ocean eye multi-mode radar india's got 18 p8i's and it's the only other variant with its own designator uh, i p8i i presumably standing for india um all other p8s owned by or operated by all other nationalities um are known as the p8a so there's only an a and an i um and only the indians operate the i Okay, moving on. Beneath the APU, you've got this uh, ANAQ24V directional infrared countermeasure. Oh, I 
Dirkham system for protection from infrared guided missiles. So if you're getting shot at in your P8, this is what is going to save you bacon. If the MWS sensors detect a missile, the signal gets processed to determine its type and a suitable response. So it's not the same response for each type of, uh, of threat. Um, it's normally for the, the Guardian Pointer Tracker Assembly, the, the GPTA, to laze the missile, which will jam it, um, hopefully sending it off course, the, uh, the GPTA being that little uh, sort of blister underneath. If the laser fails, the process will issue a command to the flares to dispense the appropriate flare type to defeat the specific missile threat. Okay, to the either side of the, the Durkham, you got a pair of ESM antenna. Uh, again, I can't say any more about those. Um, that's that's what they're listed as. Um, underneath multiple, and not only underneath, but all around the aircraft, there's multiple new comms antenna. These are the same size and shape as the civilian DME antenna, but I doubt they are. Um, why would it need three DMEs? Um, anyway, who knows? Uh, the blister at the back here is the common data link uh, antenna from uh, L3, now Harris L3 Avionics. Uh, we've got more uh, Sonoboy launchers. These are uh, the, the, the one at the back, that's single shot Sonoboy launchers. The, there's one on this side and two on the other side. Uh, whereas conversely for the, the rotary Sonoboy launchers, you've got two on this side and one on the other side. Um, the, the 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 rotary launchers operate like a revolver and can carry ten boys per launcher. Underneath again, something you don't see on the Civi 737, you've got a weapons bay. Uh, in place of the aft hold, there are five uh, hard points in there. You can count them, and it'll carry uh, internal stores such as Mark 54 torpedoes. Mark 62 quick strike 500 pound mines and Mark 82 depth chargers. So all kinds of kit you can fit in there. Um, alternatively, for um, you, you can actually fit a SARC at search and rescue kit there. Um, so if 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 you're doing SAR ops with it, you can you can go out on onto onto task and and drop it wherever it might be needed. So there's uh, there's humanitarian um, uh, uses for the uh, for the P8 as well. Just ahead of the uh, the weapons bay, you've got I, again another one of these um, uh, countermeasure dispenser systems, the CMDS. Again, remember there's two two at the back, one on e e each side, the same place on the other side, and two at the front that we saw earlier. The large blister underneath that's the uh, the ESM scanner. And that's another view of the of the bulge on the cowling for these uh, these 180 uh, KVA IDGs. Uh, again, if you w when we look inside the cabin, you you'll see what a, a vast amount of onboard electrical equipment there is. Hence the need for for uh, greater and uh, uh, electrical generation capability. Um, also, again, you know, kind of going hand in hand with a large amount of electrical equipment, it, it generates a large amount of heat. Um, so the, the the ECS, the Environmental Control System, has has been uh, improved to to enable adequate cooling of all of those electrical systems on board. This is uh, the the other side view of the the captive air training missile and the the CFM fifty six. It's it's still a dash seven, the same as on the uh, on the NG, and they've got the twenty seven k thrust version as you would expect with those very high weights. Uh, various antennas similar to those on the left side of the fuselage. Uh, raked winglets, mentioned those before, there's a close-up shot of one here, again they add about uh, 1.85 metres to the wingspan over a blended winglet NG. Um, I believe the reason that, you, that they've got raked winglets over blended winglets is that they can be de-iced. Um, 
it's basically just an extension of the standard leading edge de-icing system there. Um, that's necessary when operating for extended periods at low, medium level in weather. And those of you that have watched my winglet video will uh, know, because I, again I went into the sort of theory and detail of it, that um, wing wingtip extensions like these rigged winglets are actually more fuel efficient than the upward pointing winglets. So uh, these could actually give uh, more range and endurance than, um, th than a standard blended winglet. So se several reasons for, for having these. IFF antenna, just a close up of those on, the, on this side. Again, there's another pair on the other side. And uh, again, same on the, as, as on the other side in the SM array here. Uh, so a long view from the side showing another variant of the of the P8. Um, this has got the the airborne ground surveillance uh, pod on it, the the ANAPS 154 advanced airborne sensor. That's an elect uh, an active electronically scanned array. Uh, on the on the bottom of the fuselage there, and notice as a result of having that, uh, Boeing have had to add two large aft ventral strakes for stability. Um, this unknown pod, pod, sorry, um, photo courtesy of uh, of Josh Kaiser, uh, was was spotted. Um, taxiing out from uh, from Boeing Field, no idea what it is or what it does, um, but just to show you that the you know w one's facility f f is is made for hanging a pod under the aircraft, then really you know you you can hang anything under it, um, you know within the, the the geometry confines of the aircraft, so uh, so all kinds of things could be appearing there uh, you know over the uh, over the lifetime of the P8. Okay, on to flight deck differences. Start by looking at the uh, the forward and centre instrument panels. Um, this graphic, courtesy of the uh, the Royal Australian Air Force, uh, lists uh, many of the differences on um, on their aircraft. Again, not all aircraft or not all countries have the same kit and uh, and layout. And again, there are there are subtle differences between the the P8 and the uh, and the E7s. Um, but you know that the, they're they're all sort of you know. The, They've all got most of it. Um, the, the, there's only little differences either side. So again, let's let's take you through these step by step. So on the upper DU, you see that there are lots of new alert and status messages. Some of these are replacing captions that were previously located elsewhere. Um, so again, just going from top to bottom on on you know the the ones which are displayed here. EGI is embedded uh, GPS INS. Uh, IFF mode four stroke five. Again, the, the IFF identification friend or foe. It's a military version of uh, um, the transponder, um, and it's got various operational modes. So this is just showing you what mode it's in. Engine oil pressure uh, one and or two. Um, the, the the McDo MCON fail, so it's MCON being an emission control. So it's you know what uh, what signals you're, you're you're giving out. You know if you want to go into let's call it stealth mode. Um, OBIGs on board in a gas generation system. This is a military version of uh, NGS. Uh, again, see my NGS video for for, for details on that. Um, then down to the whites, we've got um, this asterisk RCF message, which is radio control function message. This is a regular pre-fright nu nu nuisance message. It's kind of always there. Um, then interestingly, the next pair are door enunciations. Uh, you, you've got entry forward and air stair. Now these replace the doors panel on the overhead panel. So there, there is no doors enunciator panel on the overhead panel. It's all done here on the upper DU now. Um, and the last one is um, AF GMP ground mode, which is the, the, the AF ground maintenance panel uh, switches in the, in the ground mode. So again, the, 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 there's a whole load of these new alert and status messages, but it's, it's just to show you that, you know, that that's where they're, they're, they're all now flagged up. 
Um, as you can see from the, the, the fuel quantity display there, the auxiliary tanks, as already mentioned, forward and aft, the, um, the, the, the forward and aft load, they're divided into, you know, three and four um, cells, if you like, uh, that they're all, you know, totalized into, into, you know, just forward and just aft, and then uh, offered there to show it all. It's, it's a very similar layout to the, um, uh, to the BBJ. Maximum fuel cap uh, capacity is uh, just over 32 ton uh, or 71,000 pounds. The uh, the new display there above the um, above the standby um, artificial horizon is the tactical threat display. Uh, this will display infrared threats as well as flare load uh, information. It's connected to the ANL Q213 system at the back for providing a display to what the sensors are picking up. Display is controlled by the electronic warfare management unit on the center console, which I will show you later. Um, cute little switch there, low level operation mode. That increases the maximum commander bank angle from 28 degrees to 45 degrees and inhibits the EGPWS two low gear and two low flaps alerts. Um, that's got an amber engage caption when it's on. And this would be one of the uses of the, the low level operation mode switch. The uh, EOIR video can be shown on uh, the inboard or low display units, the civilian uh, angle of attack display on the, uh, on the PH shows G, so that's, uh, that's G limits on, on, on that display up at the top right of the, the artificial horizon, just beneath where it says alt hold. Um, there's head up guidance for uh, for left seat. Uh, the the hood enunciator is above the FO's PFD. And again, more information on on the hood. See the hood video. F subtle difference on the the EFIS control panel. Um, instead of the uh, ADF VOR nav displays, uh, the the, the, the pointers, the, the, the labels are now labeled pointer one and pointer two to allow for the extra nav aid options um, such as TACAN. Um, so on the P8 you, you simply toggle through the available selections with these switches, you know, you, you, you just blip them up and it cycles you through, you know, ADF, VOR, TACAN, whatever it might be. The lower DU, as we've already seen, um, can be used as a, a tactical situation awareness tool. It's essentially a larger display of the of the tactical map, and the display is edited by the uh, the NFOs in the back, the non-flying officers, who, uh, who push to the pilots amplifying information about standoff from land, sonar boy drop locations, vessel locations, whatever it might be. Um, and the display can include uh, things such as the, the EOIR video, radar video, weapons video, digital video recorder playback, um, CDL stores, mission system status, uh, TSD and flight surface position indications. So there's a whole lot of stuff can be displayed on that lower DU. The auto throttle software has been tweaked to give faster engine responses required for more aggressive manoeuvring. Again, with the um, the, the the low level uh, switch, you remember you can go up to 45 uh, angle of bank on that. So you, you know you, the, the auto throttle will need to respond. Uh, this again, you don't see on uh, on civilian 737s. Red guarded caps on the the right ha the the captain's right hand yoke and the FO's left hand yoke for weapons firing. Now, I should say, typically weapons firing is all handled by the NFOs in the back of the aircraft from their consoles. But if needed, the the pilots can uh, can manually fire from there. And uh, on either side of the combing, you've got uh, electronic warfare self-protection, the EWSP press to dispense buttons, known as bang switches, uh, for the uh, the ALE 47 CMDS. So it's the um, uh, chaffs the, the, the dispensers at the uh, at the back, and the aft electronic panel. 
so coming down for the, to the side of the uh, of the low DU there, you, you, you've got an FMC. You would think the FMC will be the same, but it's not. Uh, as shown here, the FMCS index shows uh, three new sub-menus. So FMF, which is the flight management functions, these are your regular civilian FMC functions. So press that to get back to, to the, the FMC that, that, that you know and love. Um, TSMF is tactical system management function and that gives the, the pilots access to tactical and non-civilian systems. And then down at uh, three left, you've got the radio control function, and that allows Q to the, the crew to access the comms page to to tune the radio panel to uh, to custom presets. You normally tune the radios in the center console with a tuning knob, but you can do it here through the um, through through the FMCS. And on the the right hand side, you've got uh, FMCF maintenance, which is the same as uh, as on the NG. Although obviously there, there'll be several more sub menus because you've got several more systems on the on the aircraft. Down on the um, on the electronics console, you've got the tactical display that's used for non-civilian operations. Um, as you can see, you just looking there, uh, reading off some of the things. You've got tactical mode on, uh, auto accept for uh, in instructions from the from the back. Uh, bank angles engaged in normal mode at the moment. Um, it's on task. Uh, flight level one eight five. Uh, so you can see it's it's various lots and lots of pages. Again, none of which um, I'll be showing you in this presentation. Uh, need to know basis and all that. Um, you can also use it as a backup FMC. Uh, interestingly, and. Um, it, it also allows parts to display the the tactical map or the camera on the uh, on the MFD as well. And this is the tactical display again, but showing it with uh, with the menus that that uh, allow it to be to be used as an extra FMC. So down at the bottom, um, line select keys five and six, left and right. Uh, you can see we got thing you know familiar um, captions like legs, VNAV, departure, arrival, and fix. They would normally be dedicated buttons on the keypad, um, but this is a different keypad because it's the tactical display unit, not an FMC. So that that's why they're replaced by uh, by captions on the display. Um, note that the auxiliary fuel control is normally done from here. Uh, rather than with switches, as you'd find on a on a commercial 737, yeah, you know, civilian 737. Um, again, you know the the, the BBJ or those you do fly um, non BBJ aircraft with auxiliary fuel, you 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 know. And again, this is covered on my uh, both the fuel and the uh, the BBJ videos. That there there are various fuel panels to control the auxiliary fuel. They're all done away with space saving because there's a lot of new stuff on the P8 panels. So it's it's all controlled here through the uh, tactical display unit, and then onto the the radio tuning panels. Now they, these <laughs> look similar, but but they, they they are different functionality. And again, it's it's just about squeezing more more functionality, you know, in in out of the same sort of space. This is a new digital radio tuning panel. It's it's great to use. It, it it looks very different, but it's actually very intu intuitive. You can tune all the radios, nav aids, and even the transponder from from this one panel. Um, it's dead simple. You tap any of the buttons on the right to activate that field. Use the um, the, the 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 big rotary knobs at the the bottom right there to to tune the the, the frequency or transponder code. Uh, that displays in the in the right hand side in standby. Then, if you want to transfer it across to active, you just tap the left button, and it uh, it it zaps it across to the left to become the active frequency. It's a um, great bit of kit. The uh, the primary military ATC comes is UHF uh, with SATCOM available. Um, hence the uh, the the three 
first selectors that you come to are UHF 1, 2 and 3. Uh, HF's retained because the, the the long distance operations of the uh, of the P8, and then you've got Sat one and two. Uh, VHF has moved down to the the aft panel, as you can see there on the uh, on the top left of the aft panel. MIDS uh, is multifunctional information distribution system. This is basically a highly secure in theatre comm system. So when when you're out on task, um, then that's what you would be using. Uh, the CS button next to it is, is simply clear or secure. Um, if the selected radio supports the, the use of secure comms, then hit the, the CS button and to go into secure mode if, if that's what you want to do. MSN, uh, that, that switch there next to the CS, that um, brings alive the, the conference uh, facility. So it, it, pressing this will turn on or off conference one, two or three on, uh, on, on audio. Conference is basically how pilots communicate with the rest of the crew down the back. You've got to think of this as an extended version of the service interphone, uh, which actually is retained. Um, it depends It depends w w w which <laughs> which Air Force you're operating with, but typically Conference 1 is, is reserved for flight safety, Conference 2 for mission information, and Conference 3 j just for general chit-chat between the you know football scores and what, what, what have you. On the aft panel, again, very similar to, to the to the one that we have in the civilian version. So you, you've got VHF 1 and 2, uh, no VHF 3 on this, it's in opt. Then uh, SATCOM, your flight and service interphone, and the PA. Beneath that, it starts to look a bit different. Again, you've got a rotary knob there, uh, which selects audio from the respective nav aid source. So you can see here we got nav 1, or two, TACAN, ADF, marker, or IFF. Um, the volume is controlled by the rotary knob to the right, hence the, the white line connecting the rotary knob with that uh, with, with the volume knob. Uh, that white line indicating that there's, there's a link there. The RT conference switch, same as our RT intercom switch, uh, as conference is basically the PA version of the interphone. And finally, an alternate UHF. I presume this is if the if the top box with UHF one, two, and three were for some reason to fail, then you've still got a means of um, of accessing uh, UHF. Okay, moving across, you've got the um, the weapons panel. And on here you've got Cerner Boy controls, the weapon bay door, the OIR station for the uh, for the turret, weapons jettison, and uh, and weapons arm. So in sequence, uh, the Cerner Boy, you've got an arm switch, which straightforward on or off. Uh, when on, that allows the NFOs in the back to execute programmed boy drops. Typically, the way these are flown is by getting LNAV steering sent from the, 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 the tube of the back to the PFDs, and the LNAV route will have predetermined boy spit points. That's typically flown with the autopilot, unless the route needs to be you know aggressively flown. Um, and with the sonar boy arm in the on position, the boys will automatically spit out along the path, so no need for the, the parts to manually punch them out. If manual release is required, then it's done using the red guarded Sonar Boy release switch. Um, with the Sonar Boy switch on, the pilots can manually spit the boys out using this uh, spring loaded guarded switch. Um, again, it's it's mostly done by the the, the 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 NFOs in the back, but you know, as with all things, they they do give the pilots the capability of doing it if necessary. The weapon bay door uh, switch um, that selects the door open or close. Blue door caption indicates, with, which is usual standard Boeing logic, to indicate if there's a disagreement between the switch position and the door position. Below that, you've got the EOIR station, which is the turret at the um, at the front of the aircraft. Um, the left switch is. Uh, 
is labeled forward for the forward turret now again you from the photos you've seen and that the, the, there is only a forward turret they've obviously put the capability in here for an aft turret as well i don't know of any air forces which have uh have taken an aft turret but um but if they did then um i, I guess the, the this panel is future proof for for aft turret capability Um, the jettison panel there. Uh, you, you've apart from off, you've got uh, you've got three other positions for the rotary switch uh, cell. Uh, jettison specific stores selected by the NFO at the back. Um, X will jettison all external stores, but uh, but not including the weapons bay, and all jettisons everything uh, when the X cube button is is hit. And finally, on this panel, the master arm switch. Um, so this allows pilots to arm the weapon from the, from the flight station, which must be done to to, to release it. The um, you've got a kill ready red caption indicates that the weapon is ready to launch. Again, it's usually performed by the NFO in the back, but pilots can manually uh, launch the weapon from the from the yoke switches that are, that I showed you earlier. The electronic warfare panel uh, m mentioned earlier with the uh, with the display that that's that, that's just on the captain side of, of the of the engine instruments. Um, this controls the operation of the the missile warning systems, uh, the jammer, radar warning receiver, and chaff and flare dispensers. The dispensers have got a mode selector switch. Um, which you can see at the bottom right there, so it's off standby, manual, semi, and auto. Um, for to, so you got various levels of, of, you know, from manual to fully automated operation for the dispensers. Again, they're normally left in auto. Um, it's it's a very capable system, but if if you, you know, if if, if the advice from uh, from the back was 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 to fire these things off manually, then you've got the the, the ability to do that. Air to air refueling panel is uh, is all in that area there. Um, so as you saw from a, a previous photo, you, you you've you've got a, a URC, a universal aerial refueling receptacle slipway installation door um, located on the top of the copper fuselage. That's powered from hydraulic system A. From this panel shown here at the uh, at the bottom right, um, it's it. it it, you can control the, the 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 obviously the opening and closing of of the of the URC. Um, you got status lights there re relating to the door position and the fuel loading. Uh, you can then open the centre and or the auxiliary tanks to to allow them to be filled from the tanker. And uh, just to the right of the step trim override switch is the the AAR lights control there that 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 rotary switch. On the top of the combing in the in the in the center there, you've got the AAR status panel. So you've got a three-bar indicator there, um, blue, green, and amber colours signifying ready, latch, and disconnect. So for blue, which is ready at the top, the 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 air refueling system is is ready to connect. Green is latched when you're connected to the boom, and amber is disconnected, which obviously will illuminate when disconnected. After disconnection, the crew reset the system to go back to the ready light on the panel from the previous slide. And that's just a, um, a great shot of, uh, of air to air refueling in action behind a, a, a KC-135. Okay, on to the, the aft overhead panel. Um, up at the top left there, you've got the uh, a, a, a new alternate auxiliary fuel panel, and th this is the only auxiliary fuel panel there is. Now, you, you, those you've flown the the, the NG or with, with auxiliary fuel, you'll notice that there are is it two or three panels um, in in the flight deck for that. Um, here, it's all down to one plus the uh, the functions which are accessible through the uh, through the FMC or the tactical unit. So you've got forward and aft um, 
air alternate switches and vent valves and these disable or enable the the alternate auxiliary transfer system um, the switch are normally in, in disabled because the primary method of transferring fuel is through the FMC. So again, the, the, if the FMC method fails, then you've, you've got these as a, as, a, as a backup, which is why they're the alternate auxiliary fuel uh, switches. Um, you've got a nice detection system placard there, um, and I'll come on to that when, when I talk about the, the anti-ice panel. Surprisingly, the ILS and GLS lights are in OP. Um, that's unlikely to be a temporary unserviceability, but probably a permanent feature. Again, I'm not exactly 100% sure why that is, but uh, if you recall on the upper DU, the, the top caption, I think, was something like, not, not GLS, but it was, uh, it was a combined um, uh, uh, nav system caption and I think this all ties in with that so um, I, I guess they just couldn't get get a panel with with those two uh, ILS and GLS captions removed it, it was probably out of production now but um, so that I my guess is they're permanently in op um, now this panel is only fitted to a few p8s and it's probably Again, I don't know, but it's probably an emergency retract system in case of a hydraulic problem for aircraft, which have got the AAS pod. But I, I, I really don't know. And again, as always, if you know, if um, if it's not classified information, then um, then get in touch. Uh, let me know. I'd, I'd, I'd love to know. Uh, you know, purely from a technical point of view, not um, you know, not giving away any secrets or anything here. Also new to the PA, it's a, a fuel overheat test push button, and I will come on to to, to fuel overheat and and, and te uh, fuel uh, temperature uh, management uh, when we come to the, uh, the the fuel panel. And finally, on this panel, generator field reset switches. Uh, these reset the the IDG generator field control relays, the GCRs, in the uh, the generator control unit, and this is normally an engineering function uh, done on the ground on the, on the, on the Civi seven three sevens. I can only think that the reason that these are in the flight deck is because the electrical demand of the P eight is so huge that to lose 180 kVA generator you know to lose one generator would, would, would have such um, an impact on on the capability of the aircraft there would need to be facility for reset under certain conditions Obviously not if there's been a you know any kind of mechanical failure of it, um, but one of the things the the IDG will disconnect for is after um, an automatic thermal dis, uh, I, I, an over temperature. So perhaps after a suitable period of cooling, if there's a way of monitoring the uh, the IDG temperature. Uh, and it was found to come back within limits. It may be safe to uh, to do a gem field reset and try and uh, re-engage re the, the, the 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 generator. I don't know. It's it again. It's it's just um, a theory for, from me. But I and, and again, <laughs> uh, I would love to know the answer if anybody can tell me. But uh, but that's my theory for that. And um, I'll come on to, to this more when when we discuss the electronics panel. Okay, the overhead panel. Um, this is it. It, um, at first glance, yeah, it's the same overhead panel as the NG, but once you stop and look at it, you'll see that there are a lot of differences. And I will take you through the uh, the differences only um, over the next next few slides here. So, first little difference that there's an extra area on there called audio. Um, with a selector for captain on observer, normal and FO on observer, presumably because the the, 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 the jump seat is so frequently occupied. But I, again, I don't know. Um, it It's obviously a, 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 a way of getting audio um, 
on, onto wherever it needs to be in the event of some sort of form of failure. The fuel panel. This is enlarged to cater for cooling of the, uh, the 180 kVA IDGs and inspection of the fuel temperature in both wing and centre tanks. All of this is different to the, to the, uh, to the CVNG. Notice also how the sense tank pump switches and LP captions have been split to allow the cross feed valve to be lowered, thereby allowing the overhaul panel height to be reduced so that it can still fit in the same space. Um, the, the, this, the, the overall, the, this overhead panel is the same dimensions as it is on the civilian one, but they've had to fit more stuff in, so there's a lot of rejigging being done. So let's have a closer look at this fuel panel. Um, starting with fuel temperature, now the the civilian analog fuel temperature gauge is replaced by this digital readout. Um, that's partly because Boeing are trying to go you know digital anyway, and you know it's um, you know difficulty getting um, spare parts for you know analog instruments, and the, the analog are considered less reliable. Um, but not only that, it gives it more functionality. So unlike the, the Civi 737s, which only display the fuel temperature at main tank 1, on the P8 you can display the fuel temperature in either tank 1, 2, or the centre tank using those three push buttons below the gauge. And this is necessary because with with um, it's very fueling, the, the flights could be of uh, very long duration, as, as I've already said, you know, in, in excess of 12 hours, causing fuel temperatures to, to to fall, you know, dramatically from 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 cold soaking. Although it's partially offset by by heating from the IDGs. So let's look at the the, the IDG cooling. Gen one and two cooling switches. You, you you've now got there on either side of the fuel temperature uh, selectors. They can be set to auto or override, and in auto. Uh, the system sends some fuel to the IDG heat exchanger to cool the IDGs. Now you'd only select override if the fuel temperature is getting too high. In the override mode the, the control valve enters a state where it will modulate open or closed based on the temperature of the fuel. In that this mode the, the thermal load on the fuel system is reduced as less fuel is allowed to flow back into the main tanks. You've got two new captions above the cooling switches. They're labeled Gen Drive, uh, sorry, Gen Valve Fault, and they indicate a failure of the generator cooling control valve, the, uh, the, the valve which controls this operation. And I understand that from P8 crews that the fuel and IDG temperature management is something that needs um, careful consideration and it's particularly the case when departing in very hot conditions um, for which there is uh, hot weather supplementary procedures specific to the, 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 the P8 and the E7. For landing there are additional minimum fuel requirements over 737 which are based on outside air temperature. In flight though, um, fuel and IDG temperature management is not usually a problem. It, it's more for operations from, from hot airfields where, where it, it starts to become an issue. Um, back up to the top of the second column there, we've got a pod panel and that's used to power the underslung AAS pod if carried. Uh, it's got power on and off and radiate normal and inhibit switches. Um, kind of does what it says on the tin really. Um, below this on the metering panel uh, the where we did have the cabin util and IFE passenger seat switches they've been replaced by the standby power switch and the standby power off caption. Um, the, that switch and caption was moved onto this panel from its previous location on the Jenny disconnect panel which has been extensively redesigned. And there it is. The main practical differences are the addition of an external load facility and new left and right buses connected by a sync bus. The system's normally fully automated, but switches are provided to manage things manually when needed. So, looking at this in, uh, in a bit more detail. 
auxiliary load. Um, that's used to provide power to the AAS or any other ventral pod um, if the aircraft is carrying one. It's normally off unless the load's being carried and used. External power. Um, on <laughs> a very subtle difference is that um, it was called ground power on the on the civilian 737s. Now they, I don't know why they've called it external power. Um, the switch and ground power available caption is moved to the top right of the panel and there's a new on caption for external power so it's a little bit more easy to see uh, what's going on and, and, and whether it's powering the aircraft. The APU Gen has now only a single switch to connect it to both transfer bus 1 and 2. You recall it's two switches on the on the, 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 the NG. Um, however, the APU can be deselected from either of the transfer buses by the two new open auto switches below the main APU gen switch, and they give you manual control of the bus tie bar one and two. Caption between those uh, switches and, uh, and the APU is open, and the APU gen off caption is now above the, uh, the APU gen switch. So again, it's just shuffling things around a little bit to uh, to, to make things fit in the uh, in the cramped space, as as well as give the aircraft the, the increased functionality. The IDGs, APU, and ground power now connect to the left or right buses. So these are new buses uh, who don't have those on the on the civilian version, um, and there's also a new sync bus between the left and right buses. This effectively replaces the uh, the tie bus and gives it more functionality. In addition to the usual tie bus functions of of picking up the unpowered left right transfer bus in the in the event of a source disconnection or failure, the sync bus automatically parallels power from the IDGs when the aircraft's above 7,000 feet and the auxiliary load switch is on. So again, more functionality. It also parallels power if the if the aircraft's on the ground with both engines running with either external power available or the APU online. So again, more more logic to learn. Uh, if you ever thought the the regular 737 electric system was complicated, you should get yourself on a P8. That'll teach you. Um, bus ties. So there are bus tie switches on the left and right side of the sync bus to manually open the relays that connect the RDGs to the sync bus in certain circumstances. Again, as directed by the, the QRH. On the regular 737NG, the AC transfer bus 1 and 2 could be connected automatically under certain circumstances. For instance, a source disconnection or a failure via bus tie bar 1 and 2. On the P8, you've got transfer bus tie switches to manually open the bus tie bars or just leave them in auto. The four upper captions on these bus ties are open and the four lower captions of variations of bus off, for instance, transfer bus to off, which replaces transfer bus off. So again, it, it, it gives you more granularity you know it, it, it tells you more specifically what's going on the uh, the black guard of bus transfer switch on the of, of the ng that's been removed obviously replaced by uh, by these four switches the idg connection uh is is done well it, it can be done manually uh disconnected from the transfer buses using these new switches um and the captions above the switches read open um, but again, normally they're left in auto. Um, and surprisingly, for, for a, a much more complicated system, it's actually much more automatic. Um, you, you, you don't need to manually connect the generators to the buses. It, it, it will happen automatically. The source off captions of the NG are renamed Gen Off to emphasize that it's specifically the associated IDG which is not connected to the bus. So, you know, rather than the sort of semi-cryptic source off, it's now telling you it's the gen that's off. Again, it's, it's an improvement, but, you know, necessary with the more complicated system. 
The IDG disconnected switches are, are now located next to the, uh, the connect switches. Uh, and the drive captions remain above the guarded switches. So that, that's all, you know, fairly similar to what we're used to. Moving away from electric signs and calls panel, you've got a bailout signal switch. Um, that's in place of the, the no smoking switch. Um, I'm told bailing out is not authorized, even though there's a switch to signal it. So um, <clears throat> not quite sure what's going on there. Maybe it's something that's, uh, that, that, that's in the pen the pipeline. Um, captain's bell instead of attendant is used to signal the, the cabin. Um, just as an aside, the the captain um, or the mission commander um, is not always the left hand sea pilot. It depends on the level of qualification. The mission commander can be an NFO in the cabin. Um, so the guy in the left hand sea is not necessarily the captain. Um, and below that you've got windshield washer, left, right, on, off, fluid switches. This is not the old fashioned rainbow, um, which fell out of favour due to uh, health concerns. This is uh, a new fluid, I don't know what it is, um, could be soapy water, could just be water, who knows. Uh, again, get in touch and let me know. On to the ice and rain panel. Um, so this has changed quite a bit. Uh, you've got additional de-icing selections uh, for the following. Pylon. This de-ices the four pylons, you know, the, the things that hold the, um, <coughs> the the missiles out in the wings. Ext, or and, and this is in op, but the, the, this is for external store. So the, this will de-ice the, the AAS pod, for instance, if it's, uh, if it's installed. Uh, EMPWT is empennage wingtip, and that provides ice clearing for the uh, the horizon horizontal and vertical stab leading edges, as well as the raked wingtip uh, edges. Uh, I, again, that th this is necessary on <coughs> this version of the 737 because it operates or can operate for extended periods of time at that low level in weather. And radon uses a pneumatic boot to rapidly expand and contract it to, to break up ice. Uh, apparently it doesn't work too well. I'm certainly going right back to my uh, my GA days flying um, light twins which had pneumatic rubber boots. I can assure you it, it, it doesn't always work too well. I mean you, you you have to wait till you get a certain level of ice build up before you activate it otherwise you know you, you, you're a bit you're a bit stuck. Uh, how exactly you assess that from the, the flight deck of a 737, how you assess your nose cone, I'm not sure. But anyway, um, the feedback was it wasn't working too well and this may have changed or been removed with the new white nosed P8s which have just started to appear in the last year or so. So I think things are, are moving on this front. The raked wingtips, horizontal and vertical stabs are electrically de-iced um, by an electromechanical expulsion de-icing system, EMEDS. Um, what it does, it shakes ice off the surfaces by using actuators in the, the cavity behind the leading edge. And they are, it, well, it's claimed they can dislodge ice thicker than uh, 0.15 a centimeter or uh, six hundredths of an inch. Um, and the observer's window is also heated. The P8's got an ice detection system as standard, again due to its uh, all-weather low-medium level operating environment. Um, and there's a dedicated ice detection probe on the right-hand side of the nose. And that'll be familiar to some of you who fly uh, civilian 737s which have got this fitted. It was a, it, it's been an option going right back to the classics. Um, I've flown both classics and NGs with uh, with with this ice detector probe. It, not many have got it fitted. You know, it, it it's not an option many airlines took, but um, but all the P8s have got it, and as you would expect with their operating environment. Um, so that probe works by having a magnetically induced vibrator. Uh, if ice starts to form on the vibrator, the frequency of, of the vibrations will change, and an icing signal is sent to the flight deck. A heater will then um, be automatically turned on to melt the ice. 
if no ice is detected for 60 seconds and no ice signal is sent to the, the, uh, the flight deck. There's also an ice detector light on the, the anti-ice panel which illuminates if the ice detection system fails. Doors panel, as I've already mentioned, um, it's gone. Uh, it's been removed. All the door slates is now on the, the upper DU. The hydraulics panel is the same, but it's been moved down slightly to where the doors panel was to make you room for the extended anti-ice panel, which is expanded uh, to, to, to cover the pylon external empennage and, and radome functions. Okay, vulnerability reduction features. Let's have a look at some of these. So the P8's got a number of these uh, features designed to improve its survivability when hit by likely gun threats. Uh, they include a dry bay fire protection system and onboard inner gas generation system. The Navy completed live fire tests on an actual P8 airframe, would you believe? It was the uh, the structural test airframe uh, to assess vulnerability to ballistically induced structural failure and sustained dry bay fire. So it's um, it's been well and truly tested. So this uh, this appears um, in in various forms, but the uh, the vapor purge panel is one of those and this is part of the dry bay fire protection system. The vapor purge switch is used in the event of ballistic damage to the lower fuselage, specifically the area around the auxiliary fuel tanks in the low fuselage. There are sensors in the low fuselage that detect the presence of fuel vapor and if it reaches a certain threshold it sends a CDS message to the pilots who will then put the vapor purge switch on that will introduce clean dry air from the ECS and open purge valves to expel any uh, trap fuel vapors. So it basically washes the area through with, with, with clean dry air from the, from the, the air conditioning system to, to get rid of any, any fuel vapors. OBIX, uh, the onboard inert uh, gas generation system, it's, it's basically NGS on steroids. Um, it goes way beyond the the, the CIVI NGS system by introducing the, by reducing the oxygen levels in all of the fuel tanks. So not just the center tank like our NGS system does, but in all of the fuel tanks to a non-combustible nine percent during most flight conditions. Um, in actual fact, that they're only slightly exceeded nine percent uh, during emergency descent and. See my NGS video for for, for the full theory of uh, of why that happens. The um, the Navy describes uh, OBIGS as a survivability feature that maintains inert fuel tank environments to improve ballistic projectile projection protection. Um, it also pressurizes the auxiliary fuel system, so it puts a head of pressure on the auxiliary fuel to push the that fuel through to the the, the center tank as the center tank fuel is uh, is 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 burnt. Obigs, it's uh, it's fully automated, uh, much to the relief of the crew, and it'll switch between low, mid, and high flow depending on the state of the aircraft. So on the ground, OBIG starts in standby when the the uh, the secondary power distribution system is turned on. Um, the SPDS located in the mid cabin of the aircraft and it'll automatically power on when the aircraft APU is turned on. When OBIG is in standby um, from the SPDS, the crew can select auto or standby from the FMC. When in auto and on the ground, the OBIG then goes to low flow, then switches to mid flow for the inerting process. In the air, OBIX almost never uses low and automatically uses mid in, in climbs and high in, uh, in steep descents. And steep descents, for that read, emergency descents. Um, any, anything where, where the, the, the oxygen generation ne needs to be um, or the, the inner gas generation needs to be uh, supplied at a higher rate. 
All right, cabin features next. Um, now these, I should say, vary from uh, vary a lot from from you know Air Force to Air Force or Navy to Navy, um, country to country. Let's say um, the the photos I've got are, are from the uh, the Royal Air Force, um, or I think most of them are. Um, but but they that they all apply, you know, in general terms to 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 all aircraft. Um, so you can see the um, the warrant officer there's got a a hand controller in his his left hand, you know, that that sort of uh, side stick type arrangement. That's for the EOIR camera, um, and he's got a trackball in his right hand um, to uh, to move the cursor on the displays. Two MCWs are equipped with hand controllers. One uh, in in the U.S. Navy, two, say two in the the RAF, and all five have got the trackballs. Looking aft down the cabin, uh, there are five workstations in, in this particular one, but you, you can have up to seven. Usually, the first two are acoustic panels, uh, listening to drop sonar boys and 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 the like. The middle station would be the the mission commander or the or the taco as you call them in the the RAF. Then the information manager, then EW, radar, ESM. All of these workstations are reconfigurable, so in theory anybody could sit anywhere. Um, obviously, for comms, it's it it it's easier to have the taco in the middle. Um, but apart from that, you can you can sit where you like. The U.S. Navy P8's got six crew stations. And starting from front to rear, they've got a, uh, a Kotak, Taco, Sensor 1, Sensor 2, uh, then 3 and 4. Um, 1 and 2 being acoustic, 3 and 4 being radar and camera. These are what the workstations look like in, in action. Uh, so you've got two 24-inch stack displays. Um, Note that what's displayed on the lower screen is essentially the display that, that can be projected to the, the flight deck lower DU. Um, obviously with a slightly different aspect ratio, but um, but the, the lower screen can be thrown to the, uh, the flight deck. That's a typical workstation comms pad. Um, net 1, 2 and 3, which you see down the left hand side there, that's the NFO's version of conference 1, 2, 3. Um, six rotary knobs above and below the display their radio comms that you can listen into it's it's much like the, uh, the the audio selector panel in the in in the flight or functionally it's it's the same it's it's probably got more radios and more things to listen to but um, but that's their version of it um, now I've, I've already mentioned a lot the the electrical load on on the aircraft being huge this really I think brings it home to you just how huge that load is. Um, this is the central area power distribution racks uh, E810 to 860. Um, it's enormous that takes a lot of power and a lot of cooling so that's why you, you, you've got those increased um, IDGs on the the engines and the um, the air conditioning system has, has been beefed up to uh, to keep the cooling of, of those at, at safe levels. Behind those power distribution racks, you've got a mission planning desk there with uh, what's that four seats and a and a map planning table. Looking at some of these racks and what they might contain, again, just in general terms, um, the uh, 810, which is the, the, the Ford and Axe comms racks, lots of mission racks as well as equipment for mission crypto, key fill and, and zero eyes. 820's got the EOIR components, 30 and 40 have got the uh, the MCDS stuff, so PDSU, BDUS, SNS drives. 860's the, the Ford sensor rack, that's got components of the ESM and the, the mass, and 870's got uh, equipment for the, uh, the ANAPY radar in the nose, as well as the IFFI and ESM system. Um, here you can see that in addition to that huge um, 810 to 860 rack in the middle, you, you've got other power racks, the E101 and 102 shown here in, in uh, circled. 
they've got components for the secondary power distribution system um, that, that controls power to, to most mission systems and the, uh, the SPDS CDU is, is on the, the right power rack. Soden Boy storage racks, these are known as the wine racks uh, for obvious reasons. Um, and the rotary launchers are here. They, as I said, they, they operate like a revolver and carry 10 boys per launcher. All the chutes are pressurized for, uh, for, for launchers on, on these rotary ones. These are the unpressurized chutes, these are or free fall chutes, and you can see um, so there's a, um, a, a guy here just about to, 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 to launch a marker. Um, so they can be used to, as I say, de deploy markers, smoke, or dispose of ha hazardous so sonar boys out of the chute. So you can expel anything from the aircraft that, that you, you, that'll fit uh, out of that chute. That's it. That's the, the, the P8 um, and touching on the E7 as well. As always, please, if you've enjoyed the video, give it a like, subscribe to my channel if you haven't already done so, and uh, and, and share it amongst your colleagues. Um, a lot of the information um, on the P8 is included in the book. If you haven't already got one and you fancy buying me a beer, then, uh, then pick up a copy of the book, either printed or from Apple Books. Once again, thanks for listening.